So it's been a little over a month since the Ryzen 5000 series CPUs have launched, and I think it's fair to say that they're pretty amazing uh, and in super high demand. Every model is sold out absolutely everywhere, but unlike those AMD GPUs, at least these processors have been restocked semi-regularly. Anyways, with every new processor release, there's always something new to learn and discover. And in this video, we're going to focus on what you should look for in a memory kit that's gonna be paired with a Zen 3 CPU. And yes, I know there are a lot of these around, but our intent here is to approach this as a guide for newcomers. This isn't meant to point out a single kit and say, hey, that's the best, but rather you know, guide you through to making a more informed decision. And that means to walk you through explaining the effect of three main things, memory ranks, latency and frequency, and what each of those things means. Of course, there's also a few other technical things like infinity fabric frequency limits and overclocking, along with some of the speed bumps that you can expect along the way. There's also a few shout outs that I need to make too. First of all, I wanna thank Crucial for helping us out with this video. Even though the advice that we're gonna be giving you guys uh, can be made for pretty much any memory kits out there, they did supply us with a ton of different combinations for more apples to apples testing. This was also a whole team effort as well. Mike, myself, and Patrick sunk in over 200 hours of time into this and uh, we learned a lot of things and we're really excited to share our findings with you guys. It is finally here. Your screen enemies are not ready. Listen to this. The new SteelSeries Aerox 3 wireless and wired mice. Super lightweight for deleting heads and cool shell design too. Super mesh USB-C cable with fast charging. Insane battery life up to 200 hours. Dual wireless connection for flexibility. The mouse is IP54 rated for water and dust resistance. The TrueMove sensor is incredible with switches of up to 80 million clicks. I mean, come on, give the hand what it wants. Check out the new SteelSeries Aerox 3 mice down below. The first thing I really want to talk about is the memory kits that Crucial sent our way for this video because I'll be referencing them a lot. Um, the standard ballistics lineup comes with either RGB that's controllable with your motherboard software or with a plain you know, heat spreader. Personally, I prefer the stealth looks of the standard non-RGB modules that also come in three different heat spreader colors like white, black, or red. These are available in speeds up to 3600 megahertz right now and represent the more affordable options in Crucial's lineup. And then there's the Ballistic Max series and I'm sure you've seen me using them in a bunch of builds lately. Their matte black, non-eliminated look are just perfect for blending in with pretty much any build. And they're fast too, with 32 gigabyte kits hitting 4400 megahertz mark. And that's important for this video since it'll give us a chance to test at lower frequencies, but much tighter timings. Now, since Crucial and Micron, their parent company, are able to control pretty much all aspects of DRAM production, these kits can be tuned from the ground up for some pretty unique creations. Uh, they've also been able to bin memory chips, which allows for the creation of kits like this. Right now, this is one of the fastest memory kits on the planet running at 5100 megahertz. And later in this video, we're gonna push the AMD platform to the max with it. But the bigger question is, will it make much of a difference? Now, speaking of the platform, we're gonna talk about a well-known and settled topic that some crazy reason people seem to be rediscovering with Ryzen 5000, and that's single rank versus dual rank memory modules. But let's start with explaining what rank actually is. To put it super simply, a rank is a group of memory chips that are all physically linked together and that can all be accessed at the same time together. You see this memory stick? These eight memory chips are all grouped together in a single rank. And if I flip the memory over, there are no memory chips on the other side. Therefore, this is a single-sided, single rank memory stick. On the other hand, a standard dual rank memory module would have chips on both sides with each side forming its own grouped rank. Right now, the majority of DDR4 kits follow a pretty basic rule. Eight gigabyte sticks are single-sided and single rank, and 16 gigabytes and higher sticks are dual-sided and dual rank. But I hate to say this, there are a few very minor exceptions. For example, Crucial has transitioned all of their high-speed Ballistics Max 32 gigabyte kits to single rank in order to push their frequencies. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if other manufacturers started doing the same thing, but we'll just have to wait and see. Now, if you wanna know the rank count on your current memory kit, just open CPU-Z, click on the SPD tab, and ranks are listed right over there. Now, why is this all important? Well, ever since the launch of the first gen Ryzen processors, memory ranks has been a topic of discussion in a way that never happened on the Intel side. The reason being, first gen and second gen Ryzen CPUs had pretty weak memory controllers. 
Uh, these older Ryzen CPUs handled single rank memory and two modules being installed pretty well, but not high speed dual rank modules or other setups. And that led to highly clocked single rank DDR4 performing better than lower clocked dual rank DDR4 on early Ryzen systems. And this is where the legend that dual rank memory was bad with all Ryzen CPUs got started. Now, thankfully, Nowadays, the Ryzen 5000 series processors have very strong memory controllers, so they can handle dual RAM memory kits that are clocked as high as your Infinity Fabric or even your motherboard can handle. I hope that all made sense. Now, the reason why dual rank is faster is very simple. RAM or random access memory only does two things. It's accessed and it's refreshed, and one memory rank can only handle one of those operations per cycle. However, when a single stick has two ranks, one rank can be accessed while the other is being refreshed. And this is called rank interleaving. And obviously being able to run two operations per cycle instead of just one leads to performance benefits. But that increase isn't universal and some apps see significant gains while others see almost none at all. And I'll be showing you that in just a bit. Now, the main point is that most CPUs perform best when their memory controller has access to two ranks per memory controller channel or four ranks in total. Now, this can either be done with two dual rank modules or you can achieve the same rank interleaving by using four single rank modules. Now, there is a problem with this on a few fronts though. If, for example, you buy four single rank sticks, you've already maxed out the available motherboard slots. It's also usually more expensive to buy four eight gigabyte sticks rather than two 16 gigabyte ones. So what kind of performance differences can you expect between the various rank configurations? Well, that's where we're gonna jump into our benchmark results momentarily. But first, here is our test system. We're using a Ryzen 9 5950X, but the results can be carried over into other CPUs as well. As for the other items, there's an RTX 3090 to try to eliminate GPU bottlenecks as well. Now this config will be used for all of the benchmarks you see in this video. And here's the various RAM configurations that we tested. And all of these were done with the timings of 16, 16, 16, 16, 36, one T, and all the way from a single eight gigabyte module to four eight gigabyte modules and two dual rank 16 gigabyte DIMMs. Crucial also hooked us up with a few pretty rare 16 gigabyte single rank memory modules. Now, while they aren't common right now, like I said, I'm pretty sure we'll start to see them as memory speeds increase. Now, starting off with Adobe Premiere's media encoder sees its biggest performance improvements going from a single eight gigabyte module to two modules. And again, from uh, 16 gigabytes to 32 gigabytes. There's a very small jump going from single rank 16 gigabyte modules to dual rank, but it's there. In Blender, there was zero difference between a single eight gigabyte module installed and 32 gigabytes worth of single rank 16 gigabyte modules, which is likely due to this being a super CPU intensive app. But again, we saw an improvement going to dual rank per memory channel with the 32 gigabyte dual rank kit and four eight gigabyte modules. Autodesk Maya rendering tightens up the race even more with all the results being well within the margin of error. One thing I do wanna mention here is that while rendering isn't impacted by a small eight gigabyte memory footprint, 3D orbiting of high resolution models becomes almost impossible. In handbrake transcoding, there's a clear step down in performance going with single rank kits, and of course a massive penalty for going with a single channel populated. Finally, WinRAR is a super memory intensive program, but the difference between single and dual rank layouts is massive. The gaming results are also pretty interesting too. So it's obvious going with a single channel layout is a big mistake and using dual rank modules or four by eight gigabyte layout can have benefits in some titles. On the other hand, dual to single rank will only net you a few percentage points difference most of the time. So with this first step done, it's pretty obvious that some programs benefit a lot from going with dual rank modules or populating all four memory slots, but other apps don't see nearly as much of a performance uplift, but as often as possible, we'd still recommend sticking to dual rank layouts since they're consistently better in pretty much majority of situations, um, if even only by a few percentage points if I'm being perfectly honest. The next step in all of this is timings and latency. The new Zen 3 architecture brought a bunch of physical changes to the CPU die. And the most important of which is the new unified cache that has up to eight cores and can access all at once or that one core can have full access of. The result of this new structure is a serious reduction in cache and memory latency compared to Zen 2. The memory latency improvements happen even though the memory controller hasn't changed at all compared to the previous generation. In the most simple terms, the data has less hoops to jump through. And with automatic reduction in memory latency, the big question is, 
do these Ryzen 5000 CPUs actually still benefit from using lower latency RAM? And is there now a point of diminishing returns when it comes to tighter timings? Well, let's find out. Since we've already established that 2x16 gigabyte dual RAM kits achieves the best performance, so we're gonna stick to that and then we're gonna lock it to DDR4 3600 and then test a bunch of timings. It used to be that latency meant a lot when it came to hitting the best performance, but for the most part with Zen 3, going from tight CL14 timings to CL20 actually nets very little in real world benchmarks. A lot of this is likely due to AMD's ultra fast and heavily upgraded cache design. Gaming on the other hand, does see some small frame rate bumps with these tighter timings, but those are mostly focused on 1% lows rather than overall averages. So what does this all mean? Well, there's still a performance benefit when using lower latency RAM, but not all that much relative to what you're gonna be paying for with a kit with super tight timings. Plus, it's getting a lot harder to find memory with true low timings these days. Plus, chasing lower latencies might prevent you from hitting the DDR4 3600 to DDR4 3733 memory speeds. That's still the sweet spot, just like they were found on Zen 2. Now, you might be saying, hold on, I thought that there was an improvement this generation and that a 2000 megahertz Infinity Fabric and DDR4 4000 were supposed to be easy. Why are you still using DDR4 3600 and 3733 as a sweet spot? Well, that's just not the case, at least not yet, and maybe not ever. But to understand why, I need to talk about the ratios and what the one-to-one -one ratio mode is and why it's so important on the Ryzen platform. You see, on Ryzen 5000, just like Ryzen 3000, the memory clock, Infinity Fabric clock, and the memory controller clock are all automatically locked in a synchronous one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio from DDR4-2133 all the way up to DDR4-3600. Now, past that point, those three frequencies are no longer synchronized. The Infinity Fabric is set to 1800 megahertz and the memory controller ends up running at half the memory speed. And when this happens, you get a memory latency penalty of about 15%, which means a big hit on performance in many situations. Now, many of you watching this right now with Ryzen 3000 systems and overclocked memory are probably smashing into this same problem without even knowing it. And an easy way to verify this is to download Zen Timings, and I'll make sure to link that down below. You basically have to check out the top right corner. The MCLK is the memory frequency, the FCLK is the infinity fabric frequency, and the UCLK is the memory controller frequency. If they aren't all at exactly the same frequency, then you're leaving performance on the table. And by the way, we always use the one to one to one ratio rule because it's simple to understand and it gives extremely good performance in a wide range of workloads. But as with everything memory related, there's tons of exceptions and extreme configurations. Thankfully, pushing above DDR4 3600, you can manually adjust both the memory controller and the infinity fabric frequencies back in line at a speed of 3730 megahertz and above. Now head over into the AMD CBS menu, load up the XFR enhancement, adjust the fabric clock so it aligns and finally make sure the UCLK of memory controller frequency lines up as well. 3730 megahertz at one to one should be relatively easy on most CPUs, but above that point, it gets a lot more challenging. And speaking of challenges, We've achieved infinity fabric speeds of 2000 megahertz and above with one-to-one -one memory speeds of DDR4-4000 and even higher many times. Our 5800X hit 2000 megahertz at DDR4-4000 flat. The second 5800X hit 2100 megahertz and DDR4-4200. And our 5950X hit 2033 megahertz at DDR4066. All of those were very low and safe 24 by 7 voltages. And that's fantastic and something that was impossible on previous Zen CPUs. But look, my job is to make sure we offset cool numbers with a healthy dose of reality. Now, our team has access to the very best motherboards like the ROG Crosshair 8 Dark Hero and the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Master. Both of those motherboards have received special attention from AMD and have been fine-tuned for Ryzen 5000. Your average B550 or X570 motherboard will simply not hit these numbers right now. And most lower end motherboards that we've tried so far absolutely hate memory speeds above DDR4 3733. They might boot and load windows at DDR4 3800, but many are experiencing silent windows hardware errors since the Infinity Fabric is just unstable. AMD says that a future Agisa update will improve Infinity Fabric overclocking and as a result, one-to-one -one memory overclocking as well. But at this point, who knows if it'll help across the board. Now that you all hopefully have a little better understanding of the various memory related frequencies on Ryzen processors, 
let's find out the performance difference between them. And to do that, we ran our benchmarking suite at four different memory speeds from DDR4-3200 all the way up to DDR4-4000 and kept identical 18-18-18 timings to isolate the gains to nothing more than faster memory and infinity fabric. There's also a little wildcard here too with the same asynchronous DDR4-4000 numbers. So let's just dive right in. As you can see, there's definitely a small but steady increase in performance in a number of workloads when you boost the memory speed. Once again though, 4000 megahertz is a level that is outside the reach of most consumers at the moment. And we did have to manually synchronize the ratios as we mentioned earlier. Even in games, if we zero in on DDR4-3600 results, those do tend to be a sweet middle spot when it comes to performance. And in some cases, 3800 MHz and 4000 MHz do give a bit high performance, but they smash into the law of diminishing returns. Meanwhile, asynchronous 4000 MHz results really do show the benefits of running one-to-one. -one. And that's good news since there are a ton of pretty affordable 16 GB and 32 GB DDR4-3600 memory kits around. All you need to do to take advantage of the performance of these memory kits is to pop them onto your system and then go into the BIOS to enable XMP or AXMP or DOCP, depending on the brand motherboard you have. Now, the only downside is those affordable kits tend to have really loose timings. And as we showed earlier, timings still do matter a bit. And there's always a way to overcome that, even for novices. The first step is to download a simple program called Typhoon Burner that will let you know exactly what chips your memory kits is made with. Just press read and a bunch of information is gonna pop up. You need to know the number of ranks, uh, the revision and the memory type. Then when you know the memory type, you can enter that information into the DRAM calculator for Ryzen and that will give you a precise timings and you can enter into the BIOS and achieve lower latencies and better performance. There are safe and fast options, so check which ones work best for you. The DRAM calculator is not really optimized for Zen 3 yet, but since very little has changed and the whole memory side of the platform is basically the same, it still seems to work quite well as long as you stick to the timings suggestions and ignore the voltage recommendations. Then take a picture of this and apply the numbers in your BIOS. If and when your system boots up with the new tighter timings, you can test for stability in DRAM calculator by using its built-in memory stress test called Membench. Last but not least, you should fire up the Zen timings tool we showed you earlier to verify that all your frequencies are running in that golden one to one to one ratio. If they are, then success. Now, obviously this was just a speedy overview of what you need to do. If you want us to go into even more detail, just you know, let us know in the comments down below. But there is one last thing that I promised you and that's to push this platform to the absolute max uh, with the crucial 5100 megahertz kit. Now, can you believe that it's so fast that we actually hit the wall on the new ROG Crosshair A Dark Hero at DDR4 4866? Now switching to the Aorus B550 Master allowed us to hit it at full speed since the kit and the board are validated to run together. And no, this isn't at a one-to-one -one ratio since right now that just would be impossible. We could never have imagined achieving these memory speeds when we were testing the first and second generation Ryzen processors. The results really are impressive, but they also show how not being able to run at the magical one-to-one -one ratio can limit performance. Now, sure, there are huge speedups in the right applications, but ultimately, this kind of kit is going to be used by overclockers who want to set world records in synthetic bandwidth benchmarks rather than just normal users. It is really cool to see that these modules can do this. So yeah, it is fascinating. So that pretty much concludes this video. Hopefully it comes in handy if and when you manage to get a hold of a Ryzen 5000 series CPU. We tried to share with you every bit of knowledge that we had after hours, actually hundreds and hundreds of hours of testing without making it all sound too complicated. And I hope it worked out. And I also have to thank Crucial once again, uh, since without them, this video with apples to apples comparisons just wouldn't have been possible. This has all shown us that every little bit of extra performance matters. And when you combine all the elements of dual rank, frequencies and latency together, many small increases can lead to a pretty significant change. Ultimately, if you can afford it, our recommendation is to just buy the cheapest dual rank 32 gigabyte DDR4 3600 megahertz kit that you can find. Now, how will you know if that is dual rank before buying? Well, what we would do is advise you to check out user reviews or just do a quick Google search of the product name with dual rank added to your search keyword. Chances are someone on Reddit or a PC tech forum has probably mentioned it before. So on that note, thank you so much for watching guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this one and uh, 
I'll talk to you guys in the next one.